Hey, I'm back again, back again, and glad to see you here. I um, I wanted to share, this has been on my heart for a while, this particular discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about Smokey Robinson and his, his uh, poem called Black American. And it's going to offer a lot of insight. And I'm going to let, I'm going to show a couple clips and I'm going to let the whole poem run. And then I'm going to break this thing down. You really want to watch what I have to say about the breakdown because the breakdown is critical. Because if you just take that poem and what it said, and it's his opinion, and again, entitled to his opinion. Um, but if you take that as like fact, you will be walking down a road of misinformation and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that my aunts, I mean, my, I, I remember growing up and my aunts would sound literally just like Smokey Robinson. And that particular mentality did those of us a tremendous disservice who are part of Generation X. Now, this doesn't take away from uh, all the contributions and, and all the love and all the support and all of that. And that's why I said we, get, we got this dysfunctional thing where we can't, we don't feel as though we can challenge something that may be off. And, and then when that happens, we walk around frustrated. And so I'm a challenge stuff that's off. You know, I'm at the age now, like, look, psh, whatever, you know. Uh, I, I remember my aunts, but I'm not African. I'm not this, that, and the other. And, and it was almost like programming. Um, it, but it was, it was, but it was programming, but then it was like a trauma response and coupled with ignorance, coupled with a whole lot of different things. And, uh, and so when I hear Smokey talk about this stuff, I can tell that he doesn't have a whole lot of the story. So let me just play this one clip and then I'm going to get into his, um, into his, his poem. Okay. Um, see, uh, I, I'm a person, I, I resent being called an African-American. I really do. Now, I've traveled all over the world, and Africa is one of the few places in the world that I've never been yet, okay? But I think that when you do that, you're disclaiming all the things, all the co contributions that black people have made to America. You see, I consider myself to be a black American, and I enjoy being called black. And black has been so negativized as a color down throughout history by those who wanted to negativize it, and so it spilled over into the black community, into the black people. And even black people back in the day calling each other black was a sign for a fight or something like that because it had been so negativized, like black was just so negative. So I resent being called an African-American because black people have contributed so much to the development of the United States of America. Uh, you mentioned the poem. And, 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 and I sent you guys these books, black history books, and I hope each one of you got, got them. It's, it, it tells all the black contribution, contributions that black people have made to America, okay? And in the poem that I wrote uh, called uh, uh, Being a Black American, there's a passage that says, all the wonderful black Americans who served in the armed forces and gave their lives in all the wars, they did not do that for Timbuktu or Cape Town or Kenya. They died from Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Louisiana and Texas and Virginia, okay? So that's how I feel about it. And we have contributed so much positivity to America, I think it should be acknowledged. I think it's a shame that only white history is taught in our schools. Everyone who has con contributed to this country should be recognized, and their contributions should be recognized. <laughs> So um, uh, that's how I feel about being black, and I'm proud to call myself a black American. Yeah. Well, you know, people always forget history. That now, um, I, I don't uh, particularly disagree with a lot of what Smokey Robinson just said. I mean, as far as, let's, we'll go with how he's breaking this down. As far as black Americans are concerned, there have been so many black Americans who have made tremendous contributions and really built this country, built America, built it. That's just, some people don't like to hear that, but um, you know, just from, you, you look at the, I, I'll go through different parts of America and I know that the cobblestone streets were built by certain people and those people were uh, black Americans. And so when you, when you begin to acknowledge that, it needs to be in the history books. It needs to be shouted from the rooftops. But the story goes deeper. And that's what is missing. And that's what was missing from when my aunts were growing up and teaching us basically to have a resentment towards Africa. What I hope to do 
in respecting, you know, Smokey Robinson is one of the the best music, the songwriters, musicians. People don't even know how many songs this man has written, and and just brilliant in that particular lane, uh, and what he's done as an entertainer over the past seventy years. I mean, smoking is, is in his eighties. Here's one interesting thing: when he first started uh, talking, he said that he's been all over the world, but he's never been to Africa. So at that point, someone should question the credibility of anything that he has to say about Africa if you've never been. Because now you're either reading something or hearing something from someone else and you've never been in that space. Uh, and then to even assert that if someone chooses to use the title African American, it's some sort of betrayal to black American and the contributions, again, is a bit misleading because both of the terms were the term black was given by white people. And the term African-American has been debated whether or not black people determine if that's what they were going to call themselves or, you know, the little leaders or whatever to determine that's what they were going to call themselves or where that came from. But to say black and to think that that's like an original term because when you go back to Africa and understand that they didn't even address each other in black and white, that wasn't even their culture, and that this identifier is something that came when we got here and it was given to us. So when you, when you really start diving into the complexities of the black experience, it is not just simple as black and white. It's very gray because different parts of the, uh, of the country had different scenarios going on. It wasn't just you know what happened in Florida was the same thing happening in New York, same thing happening in, in Mississippi and Georgia and Alabama and Virginia and all the different things that he talked about. Then when he mentioned about those people fighting in the armed forces, as you dive deeper into the history and you understand the history of America, you understand that many of these wars that people were fighting in, they were actually fighting against themselves. And that's because of the conditioning. When you understand the imperial interests, you understand the brainwashing of how the American media works and convinces us that, you know, that's the enemy without realizing, oh, no, wait a minute, we're going in there to get their resources and we're going to demonize somebody and we're just going to justify us going in to take the natural resources. See, that's the part that's missing from what Smokey was talking about. But I'll go ahead and play this clip for you because, you know, some of it is 100% spot on. I feel it 100%. But other parts of it leave gaps in there and as these people are clapping and cheering, they don't even realize what they're clapping and cheering about. And they don't even realize on many levels they're serving as agents of white supremacy. And that's how tricky and crafty that colonial imperial thing has done and how it's worked our minds. Take a look at this right here. Black man in this country, I think it's a shame that every few years we get a change of name. Since those first ships arrived here from Africa that came across the sea, there were already black men in this country. I love being black. I love being called black. I love being an American. I love being a black American. But as a black man in this country, I think it's a shame that every few years we get a change of name. Since those first ships arrived here from Africa that came across the sea, there were already black men in this country who were free. And as for those who came over on those terrible boats, they were called nigger and slave and told what to do and how to behave. And then Massa started tripping, doing his midnight tipping, down to the slave shacks where he forced he and great-great-grandma to be together. And if great-great-grandpa protested, he got tired and feathered. And at the same time, the black men in the country who were free were mating with the tribes like the Apache and the Cherokee. And as a result of all that, we're a parade of every shade. And in this late day and age, you can be sure there ain't too many of us in this country whose bloodline is pure. <laughs> but according to a geological, geographical, genealogy study published in Time magazine, <laughs> The black African people were the first on the scene. So for what it's worth, the black African people were the first on earth. And through migration, our characteristics started to change and rearrange to adapt to whatever climate we migrated to. And that's how I became me and you became you. So if we're going to go back, let's go all the way back. And if Adam was black and Eve was black, then that kind of makes it a natural fact that everybody in America is an African American. Everybody in Europe is an African European, everybody in the Orient is an African Asian, and so on and so on. That is, if the origin of man is what we're going to go on. And if one drop of black blood makes you black like they say, then everybody's black anyway. So quit trying to change my identity. 
I'm already who I was meant to be. I'm a black American born and raised. And Brother James Brown wrote a wonderful phrase. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Because I'm proud to be black. And I ain't never lived in Africa. And because my great great granddaddy on my daddy's side did, don't mean I want to go back. <laughs> now, I have nothing against Africa. It's where some of the most beautiful places and people in the world are found. But I've been blessed to go a lot of places in this world. And if you ask me where I choose to live, I pick America, hands down. Now, by and by, we were called Negroes. And after a while, that name was banished. Anyway, Negro is just how you say black in Spanish. <laughs> then we were called colored. But shit, everybody's one color or another, and I think it's a shame that we hold that against each other. And it seems like we reverted back to a time when being called black was an insult. Even if it was another black man who said that a fight would result. Because we've been so brainwashed that black was wrong to leaving the yellow niggas and the black niggas couldn't get along. <laughs> but then came the 1960s, when we struggled and died to be called equal in black, and we walked with pride with our heads held high and our shoulders pushed back. And black was beautiful. But I guess that wasn't good enough. Because now here they come with some other stuff. Who comes up with this shit anyway? Was it one or a group of niggas just sitting around one day? <laughs> Feeling a little insecure again about being called black and decided that African Americans sounded a little more exotic. Well, I think you were being a little more neurotic. It's that same mentality that got Amos and Andy put off the air because they were embarrassed about the way the characters spoke. And as a result of that action, a lot of wonderful black actors ended up broke when we were just laughing and having fun about ourselves. So I say, fuck you if you can't take a joke. You didn't see the Beverly Hillbillies being protested by white folks. And if you think, that course you think, that being called African American sets all black people's minds at ease, since we affectionately call each other nigger, I affectionately say to you, nigger please. I didn't get a chance to vote on who I'd like to be. Who gave you the right to make that decision for me? I ain't under your rule or in your dominion, and I'm entitled to my own opinion. Now, there are some African Americans here, but they recently moved here from places like Kenya, Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Zaire. But not a brother whose family's lived in this country for generations, occupying space in all the locations, New York, Miami, LA, Detroit, Chicago, even if he's wearing a dashiki and sporting an afro. And if you go to Africa in search of your race, you'll find out quick, you're not an African American. You're just a black American in Africa taking up space. <laughs> Why you keep trying to attach yourself to a continent where even if you got the chance to go and you went, most people there wouldn't even claim you as one of them, as a purebred daughter or son of them. Your heritage is right here now, no matter what you call yourself or what you say. And a lot of people died to make it that way. And if you think America's the leader on inequality and suffering and grieving, how come there's so many people coming and so few leaving? <laughs> Rather than all this fine thought with America shit you're promoting, if you want to change something, use your privilege. Get to the polls. Come as a voting. God knows we've earned the right to be called American Americans and be free at last. And rather than you moving forward with progress, you're dwelling in the past. We struggled too long. We've come too far. And to the folks that know who we were, let's be proud of who we are. We're the only people whose name is always a trend. When is this shit going to end? Look at all the different colors of our skin. Black is not our color, it's our core. It's what we've been living and fighting and dying for. Yeah. But if you choose to be called African American and that's your preference, then I give you that reference. But I know on this issue I don't stand alone on my own. And if I do, then let me be me. And I'd appreciate it if when you see me, you say, there goes a man who says it loud. I'm black, I'm black, I'm a black American and I'm proud because I love being an American. And I love being black. I love being called black. Yeah, I said it and I don't take it back. All right. I, uh, well, one, I want to, you know, definitely acknowledge that Smokey Robinson is entitled to his opinion. And there are quite a few people who share that same uh, opinion. And that's uh, fine. I just want to add some thought to this because it, it large, largely goes without any additional thought. Well, right now, I'm in Accra, Ghana. And feel quite welcome in Accra, Ghana. Uh, when I'm in Lagos, Nigeria, people don't even, they can't even tell that I'm not Nigerian. If they just look at me, they can't even tell I'm not Nigerian. They think I'm actually Igbo from Nigeria. 
I've been to 17 different African countries. And I wasted 45 years listening to the type of mentality that Smokey Robinson just projected uh, to try to, or even on the flip side, to try to identify me. When, and when I began to look at it, I was like, well, I can claim both. I can claim America because I was born in America, born in Charleston, South Carolina, raised in Washington, D.C., so you can't take my black American card from me. But then when I come over here, and I see the similarities, and I see the misinformation is being projected, I'm now able to deduct something different for myself. And so this is my opinion. And my opinion happens to differ from uh, Smokey Robinson's opinion, a person who's never been to Africa. He's been, if we want to talk about white supremacy, he's been to all the white places, I'm sure. I'm sure he'll go sing and dance and you know, do the little tap dance in Europe. But for some reason, there's something, a block in him when it comes to Africa. It's the same block that people had when it came to being called black. I know exactly what he's talking about. People don't want to be called black because that's a negative thing. But black and African go hand in hand. So it just depends on how somebody's perceiving it. So my aunts and my culture had it to where I didn't even think about wanting to travel to Africa. And then I came. And so because I came and I saw many of the things that they told me, those Africans don't like you. They're not going to see you as brothers and sisters. And maybe some don't. Well, see, the first thing is they didn't even explain that there was thousands, there were thousands of different cultures, thousands of different cultures, not a hundred here, thousands of different cultures and languages. So it's not you can find within one of those man-made colonized countries you can find hundreds of different cultures in different languages. But that was never explained because everybody was trying to be Cherokee and Apache and everything else along the way. Then when I started thinking about my American ancestors, my black American ancestors, the ones who bled and died and built America, I have to wonder whether or not they bled and died and built America for me to have opportunities, for me to stay stuck on the same ment ment mentality and the same plantation. Perhaps they de bled and died and built and did all those different things so that I could have take that privilege that he referred to, to be able to travel the world and explore and do the things that they weren't able to do. See, that's the thing that I had to start thinking about as I hear talk like this because, I, you know, obviously in these social media streets, you run into people who have varying opinions. You, this is who you are. How, you, how are you going to define me? How are you going to label me, but yet you don't want to be labeled? That's hypocrisy. That's contradiction. And so you see this over and over again on so many different levels, and it, and it should be addressed because what it's doing is I listened to that mindset for so long. And it kept me away from some of the biggest blessings in my life, opportunities, because I'm trapped on the American plantation physically and mentally. And so when you talk about, well, why are so many few people leaving America and so, uh, so many people coming, perhaps people are coming to get back what was stolen from them. Because when you understand the history of America and you understand the history of how it has gone around the world and really stolen, killed, destroyed, raped, pillaged, done all these different things to Africa, to include its natural resources, to include its human resources, to include so many different aspects of it, even to this day. There's no way someone who is truly knowledgeable about imperial, global, colonization, whatever you want to call it, there's no way someone who's truly educated about it would ever recite those words with that much passion. And so it just reveals that we talk about the white supremacy, that mindset is a white supremacy mindset. Now, again, this has nothing to do with, you can love being both, and that's what I am. Because when, I, when I go back to the States, I was just in the States, loving every minute of being in the States, being a part of my black American culture, being able to listen to go-go music and feel it, appreciate and embrace it, but then also come over here and see the similarities and the beats and the sounds of what that does is that empowers you. When you're able to understand where you come from on both sides, now you're no longer deficient. You don't even have to scream and cry for equality. You can say, you know what, I know who I am. I know where I stand. I'm a global citizen and it's all good. And so when you understand that you're a global citizen, you can take advantage of opportunities that other people wish they could take advantage of. But the mentality, being a slave in my own mind, is what would keep me stuck trying to figure out how to beg for the thief to give me back what was stolen from me instead of me going out, going out and figuring out how to go get it for myself. And so that's the liberation that comes from understanding the full context of the story of Africa and how it ties into the black American to the African American or whatever you want to call yourself, however you want to call yourself. See, when you limit yourself, that's another play 
and the whole game of colonization. And I hope that one day Smokey Robinson, before Smokey Robinson, before he leaves this earth, would come see for himself and to be among the people and see for himself. See, when you say that I've never been and you're holding a grudge or whatever that thing is that he has, and all you're doing is hearing about it, and you say, well, some of the most beautiful people are there, beautiful places are there. How do you know? You just hear what somebody else said. But it's not until you put your feet on the ground and really understand what happened here and how similar it is to what happened there. Do you gain appreciation for both sides, my ancestors who were on those boats, my ancestors who survived on those boats, but even my ancestors before they got to the boats and what they had to do on their way to the boats, somebody had to live. And so when you understand that part of it, there's no way an ounce of disrespect could be shown towards them because they, they didn't have a say so in it. But somehow now, no, nah, I have no. I don't even want to be bothered. I ain't even think about it. I'm a, and we're sitting around in America, fumbling around trying to figure it out. And the missing pieces of the puzzle are right over here, in a particular West Africa, for those who are of West African descent. Many pieces of the puzzle. That's why when people come here, they say they find peace. So for all of that to say, well, oh, you know, I don't understand why so few people are leaving and why so many are coming. So many are coming because if it's almost this is this is what it is. It's like the thief has gone into someone's house, stolen all of their goods to include their language, their culture, their mind, all these different things, made their house bare to them, to them. The thief is still getting all the resources and sees the value in the house. Convinced the people by way of education, media, and all these other different things that their house is no longer any good. Or they create systems of oppression that force them out. And it's like a reverse way of taking the talented away from the land and luring them back so they can now exploit their talent and continue building upon what they started 500 years ago. So that's why so many people are leaving. It's not because there's no wealth. It's because the, the ones who have the bombs and the guns and the military power can now come in and put puppet governments in place. When you understand the way the governments are set up, they mirror Western governments. So the people who are the, the Supreme Court, the two-party uh, political system, and the presidents and all this other kind of stuff, and any president that steps out of line gets shot down or removed in a coup. Who funded the coup that removed Kwame and Chroma? Who killed Muammar Gaddafi? Who killed Patrice Lumumba? Who, I mean, when you start going down a list of anybody who truly tried to rise up, what happened to them, they were killed. Well, what happened in America? Anybody who truly tried to rise up and resist the system, they were killed, imprisoned, um, character assassination, somehow they were neutralized. So when we think that we're so different, hmm, could that be a play in the whole game? So I look at this and we talk about pure blood. I mentioned this a little earlier when I was in Nigeria and a lady said it to me, she said, what state are you from? I said, well, I was born in South Carolina. I grew up in DC. She looked at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said, no, what state in Nigeria are you from? I said, I'm not from Nigeria. What do you mean? She's like, no, you must be from Nigeria. You must be from Nigeria. You look like you're Ibu. Hmm. That was unsolicited. I was in Seychelles. Same thing happened. Evil man in Seychelles. You look like you're evil man. Where are you from? When uh, he also talked about thinking about the past and, and, and letting the past go. See, sometimes when you don't know the past, it's easy to say that because we're only thinking from one narrative, slavery. We're only thinking about, you know, that, that piece of the puzzle. But when you begin to understand and you see it, when you come here, you see the resourcefulness of the people because that was still passed down. Even though the, the identity erasure, culture erasure, all of that was in place, you begin to see how people were still resilient in all of this. Uh, he talked about Timbuktu and, and Zaire and uh, uh, Zimbabwe and, and all of that. Again, when you begin to understand how deep this thing goes, there's no way you could insult. now. Again, he's entitled to his opinion. It's clear that he has limited information and that his frame of reference is only black America. It took me 45 years to get out of the bubble. I still have relatives who frown at Africa because they don't even know. 
because they have been brainwashed. And it's no different than many of the mind games that have been played in Africa and other African countries and other African ethnic groups and all of that. So I look and I say to myself that the freedom that comes from seeing for yourself. That's what's the harm in seeing for yourself? I, w I would never try to lay a history lesson down on Asia, a full-throated one like that, and never had been there. Because now I'm just picking up someone else's perspective and someone else's philosophy or someone else's documentary or someone else's. I would never do that. And so I hope, and if he, I'd, hey, I will escort him around myself with the utmost respect and say, Mr. Robinson, welcome to wherever, whichever country in Africa. Welcome to Ghana. Welcome to Nigeria. Welcome to Senegal. Welcome to Kenya, Tanzania. And, and I would, in particular, would want him to come to some of those places uh, to be able to get. And I would really prefer he come to West Africa because there's something about West Africa that once you get in the, in the, in the, in the pocket <laughs> in West Africa, there's a there's a different kind of vibe and it's a different kind of spirit in West Africa that you know and it resonates uh, a particular way, even all the way down into like Angola in that area. Um, the other thing uh, talking about is he was saying how we need to get out and vote. And I understand from his generation, that was the thing. You know, you march, you vote. And, and, and that, that struggle with people losing their lives and fighting uh, for equality in a country that you could go fight in a war and you can come back and not have opportunities and still be called nigga and still be called all these different things. Just like Mr. Doyle talked about in our video and you get handed a mop and a broom and saying, hey, you know, go figure it out. Go figure it out, boy. Go figure it out, nigga. You know, those are things that people, the realities that people live, but they didn't know how to, some of them didn't know how to express it. Because if you dare speak against that, then somehow you are a traitor or whatever. But that, but that's again, that's gaslighting, caused people to deny their realities. But a lot of people felt that they went and fought, risked their lives, got injured in war, and came back to a country that treated them like crap. That's the reality. So yeah, should you vote? Sure, go vote. But educate yourself into the bigger system. That's what I'm saying. When you educate yourself. And you really get it. Just like James talked about when we were at El Mina Dante. He was like, you know, he said it was during the civil rights movement, it was a wonderful time, but it wasn't an educational time. And he said it should have started right here. And so what I'm saying is, as much as I love Smokey Robinson music and as much as I appreciate his contribution to that era, what I hope he would do is before he leaves this earth, come see for himself. Because much of what he's feeling is not even what he would experience. And it may be a piece of liberation that he could get before he leaves the earth. And this is, you don't have to be 82, 83 years old to do this. I'm talking about you could be 12 years old and get it, don't even live your life thinking like that and understanding the game, the horrific mind terrorism game that's been played on us and how to get break free from it. And that's what happened. When I came here and I looked around I said, somebody's played a mind game on me my whole life to the point where I had no interest in even coming here. I'm running down to Cancun, and I'm going out to Bermuda, and I'm going out to Hawaii, and I'm going out to London and Paris. I mean, I haven't been to London and Paris yet, but I'm just saying these are things that I desired, but I never desired to. I didn't even know Accra, Ghana existed. I didn't know Freetown, Sierra Leone existed. I didn't know Dakar, Senegal existed. I didn't know Wida Benin existed or Lomé, Togo existed. None of this are Lagos, Nigeria. I used to call it Lagos. I know they say it differently in Portugal because you have the Lagos, Lagos, and Portugal. Hmm, just learned something there, didn't you? Um, so I, I didn't understand that. You know, I, I would hear a little something about Cape Town, Johannesburg, or something like that because that, that, that was like a favorable African country in the West because it's very similar, very westernized. Um, Nairobi, Kenya, you would hear bad things coming out of Nairobi and different things had, you know, oh, they had a bombing in Nairobi, Kenya, had this going on, had that going on, but we couldn't see the stuff that was happening. You couldn't see the Timothy McVeigh, I believe it was Oklahoma City, same same type of stuff going on right in our own backyard. Uh, it's also interesting, on the first clip, that a white media company would allow him to get on there and say those things. You know, he said, I'm a proud black American, I resent being called African American, so yeah, of course they're going to let him get on there and say that to promote his stuff. <laughs> because that, that fuels the same ignorance that's been going on for generations. But 
you think they would let me get on there and say what I'm saying? Come on now. Do you think me saying it just like this? Come on now. No, they're not going to let me get on. But they'll let him get on because he's basically carrying the narrative of white supremacy and keeping that division that has been sown for, for ages. The I'll make this um, I'll make this last point. Please do not believe that America is the savior of the world. Because when you step outside of that plantation, you begin to see what has happened. You know, there's a, a highway in Ghana named George W. Bush Highway. People have been brainwashed into saying because George W. Bush contributed towards the money of the highway. And that's why they named it after him in honor of the highway. This is how you can tell you're dealing with puppeteers and puppets and all this kind of stuff because that's what somebody who said, well, why don't you just pay me what you owe me and I can build my own highway. I don't need to take out a loan because you would have paid me properly for all the cocoa that you've extracted from my country, all the gold that you've taken from the Gold Coast, all of the... Um, all of the other natural resources, the oil, the fish, whatever, the people, if you pay me the trillions of dollars that it's worth, then a $500 billion highway is nothing. A $500 million highway, sorry. $500 million highway is nothing. There's no need for a loan because I'm properly compensated. But if the people don't understand what America and France and the UK and the Swiss and the Dutch and the Belgians and the Germans and the Spanish and Portuguese and Italians and the Chinese and the Russians and the, all these other people are coming in and what they're doing. And then the focus is focusing on corrupt African leaders that have been put in place by them. Come on, y'all. We got to see it a little bit better than what this is. And so to think that people are leaving yeah, anybody would leave a place that has been stripped naked and doesn't have any furniture, no bed, no food, anything. You're going to leave because you're trying to survive. Now, unfortunately, many people have been brainwashed into thinking that these other places are better, and so now they're aspiring to be white as they can be, and you know that, that you, know, you just see it show up on so many different levels. People just trying to, and this happens in Black America, Africa, all over the world. People are saying, "Okay, they have everything. We they, we want to be like them." But here's here's some here's some catch phrases to this. What they have in Africa, because of course, in, in a, it's the same tactic when the missionaries came in and the missionaries came in and told the people that they were uncivilized and you need to change how they dressed and you need to change their language. All these things were bad and the people believed it. And so now they aspire to be like the missionaries and they picked up their religion and picked up all this other kind of stuff and started running with it. And they just ignored themselves because they believed that when someone told, someone told them they were bad. Once you understand that play on it, you become empowered to say, you know, especially for those who are African-American or those who are part of the African diaspora who uh, went through that um, that whole transition from continent to continent, that uh, terrorism transition, if you will. What you begin to understand is that there is something unique and there is something that you can do when you can claim two places. A lot of times I hear black Americans say, we don't have a land that we can claim our own. And so I could look at that and say, well, you know, you know, uh, you could say, well, the, the, the Hispanics can go back to Mexico or they can go back to Honduras or Guatemala or Costa Rica. Uh, the Germans can go back to Germany or whatever. Even the, you know, the African Americans, they can go back. But the black person doesn't have a place they can call their own. And what I had to start doing with that is seeing that differently and not seeing that as, a, you know, what can I do about it? I can't change that. I can't now. You know, of course, America's there and you deal with what you deal with in America, which is really not the worst case scenario, just depending on, you know, where you live. So everybody there isn't racist. It's not all bad. Everything isn't bad in America. So just let me put that on the table. But you begin to understand the beauty in being global. So, OK, I might not have a country per se. But when I run and I look at my genetics and I look at my genealogy and my history, there are many countries I can claim. How many people can do that? So we don't see that as a positive. We see it as a negative. I see it as a positive. So I know when there's a part of me that comes from Ghana. There's a part of me that comes from Nigeria. There's a part of me that comes from Mali. There's a part of me in my genetic history of four or 5,000 people that come from 
in over the past 500 years to come from these regions. That's maybe one reason why I feel so comfortable. But I feel comfortable in both because I was born in America. I respect the contributions of those who were authentic, non-sellout black Americans. I appreciate their contribution. I appreciate their sacrifice. And I honor it wherever I go. And so that's why when I come to the continent of Africa, I make sure that I come here and I represent black America properly. I don't come over here and disrespect the people. I come over here and show them a different narrative because just like they've been, just like we've been told things about them, they've been told things about us. And I said to myself, I'm not going to be that black American who comes over here arrogant, being nasty, uppity, and entitled. I'm going to come over here and respect the culture. I'm going to respect the people so they see something different. And then on the flip side, and this is why I say my love for my people on both sides, I'm going to show my people in America, hey, wait a minute, we've been sold a banana up the tailpipe in the worst way. And I want you to see, yeah, there are beautiful beaches, but not only that, I'm going to take you over there for you so you can go see. I want you to experience it for yourself, unapologetically. And I want Smokey Robinson to experience it. So if somebody knows him, you know, share this with him. Uh, and again, I don't mean any disrespect in any way, but as a man who's looking at, I've been on this earth for a while um, and learned some things over these years, I've learned that while I respect my elders, I have to respect the truth more. And I also recognize many of our elders don't have the information. And so I want to make sure that we get the information. That's why so many elders watch this channel. There are people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s who watch this channel. In addition to people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So it's a, it's a transgenerational platform where people are watching because they're trying to figure out and they see things going on around them. And they're like, wait a minute. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Smokey, but uh, I don't know. It's a little different here. And maybe you've had a bad experience from somewhere, from someone in Africa. What I'm saying is, Africa's a big old continent, but 1.6 billion people. And if you let if you let 100 people shape your whole view of the entire continent, you're missing out. And that's what I realized for my people in America, we're missing out. We are missing out because we're listening to those mentalities that have been around for generations, and we're not willing to go see for ourselves. And so I hope that's what you take away from this, to go see for yourself. See for, see for yourself how they treat you for real. And when you're able to see for yourself how they treat you for real, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed at how your whole perspective, how your whole life um, can change. And I, I want to show you something. I'm going to pull this up because uh, it's a clip of a brother talking about how, what did he say? He said, you know what? He said, I wasn't even trying to go to Africa. He said, but the people were so nice. This is what he kept saying. He kept saying the people were so nice. And when you hear that over and over, when people say that over and over how they felt, that's something that you don't forget. And and you realize, because I'm pulling up right here. Uh, there we go. You realize that oftentimes... People are just repeating what they've been told. And in them being repeat in, in them repeating what they've been told, they now go push that narrative to the next people and the next people. And those people don't challenge it. And so because they don't challenge it, it becomes the truth. But it's when you when you're able to go and say, No, I'm going to go and I'm going to go see and understand what this whole thing is about, what that does is it puts you in a much better position. And I'm going to, uh, let me see, I'm going to pull up another one here. I want to pull up another one, let's see. Because I think this, I think it'll be cool. I, I think it'll be well worth, <laughs> there it is. Ah, yeah, well worth the view. I'm going to show, I'm, you know what, I'm going to show you a few. Because I want you to see what, other black Americans had to say who were willing to leave the plantation and go see something different and, uh, and, and how it's impacting multiple generations and this is the value and why we do what we do and in us doing this it 
what it does is it positions us to be in it positions us uh, to be in a in a space I don't want to, I don't want to show that right now <laughs> I was trying to no wait wait let's see if I can do this um it positions us there we go all right that'll work right there perfect all right, here we go. I'm going to show you a few clips, and uh, and I hope that as you see these clips, you'll see what we're all about here. And uh, again, somebody shares Smokey Robinson. I'd love for him to go to see for himself. I can guarantee him he will have the time of his life, and uh, that's what I know. But check out this brother right here, and uh, enjoy. I, I don't know if I should say this on camera, but we've been deceived a lot about Africa. And the utmost respect for the people here, they've been kind. I mean, ever since I put my foot on Africa, the people just been soft, kind, consistent in their kindness. Harry was not excited. I mean, like, <laughs> the day before, I'm like, you excited to go on a trip? He's like, no. Never been to Africa, never had an interest in too much in Africa. You know, just busy doing what I do in America. And so, you know, it was not something that I, you know, just really wanted to do. It's funny to watch him go from being totally wound up and uptight, not wanting to be here. First day on the Serengeti, he's like not looking at the animals. By the second day, he's jumping up, looking out the window, you know, taking pictures. So it was a process. And I would tell everybody how people are over there. They need to see it. I mean, it's amazing. It touched my heart. This trip has meant a lot for me, especially growing up as a kid. I always went to all black school, so we've always learned to like embrace our heritage and know who we are as people. So I think just coming here reminded me of what I learned as a kid and being in that school. And since I'm going back to that school to teach in the fall, now I get to take that back and I get to actually instill it into my kids as a people because we don't know who we are, where we came from technically. So I think being able to take that back to my kids and like show them examples that they can actually use in their life and just be proud of themselves. I think it's important to come here to really change your mindset about the world around you. I feel like my age group, I guess, is stuck in like ourselves. Like we're social media and all that. We're always stuck in our own little bubble, our own little world. And we're so self-centered. And I feel like coming here makes you think of others and how, I don't know, just people around the world and how the world works in a different way than just it being about you. I think last thing, I think just everybody should just come at least once and every part is different. Like not all of Africa is exactly the same. So I feel like definitely come more than once, but at least come once. <laughs> impacted me. Each trip to Africa has been totally different and this has been such a, a lifetime for me experience. It's been amazing taking my daughter to the Serengeti. It has been great. Coming back to the motherland, coming back to Tanzania, we've just had a really, really great time. I think my favorite moments were seeing all the animals. Coming to the motherland for me has just been wonderful. I've enjoyed myself, the beach, here is so beautiful. Beauty in, 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 in Africa. Um, so this has just been very impactful and I'm just honored that I've been able to bring my daughter with me to have this experience. Tanzania and Zanzibar, it is very different. It, it, it makes me feel kind of proud because this is where my roots are and this is where I know I began. Well, hello? Hello? Where? <laughs> Good to see you. How you Last time I saw you, we got it. Hello, everybody. If we can continue to find a way to bridge our differences and, you know, really, really, really come together, come to Africa, a lot of people really want to come here. This trip is not only a trip, but it really is an experience, and it's a learning experience. We've already learned so much just at the table, so I'm excited to be here, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I can't wait to continue to learn and just be with all of y'all. 
I quite didn't want to come to Africa, okay? And when I came, I got here, they were so kind. And I like, oh my gracious, then I got to meet you guys, and y'all start telling me about the trip. And I said, okay, this is gonna be fun. So now, I'm kind of excited. My wife, my wife said, well, you ain't got no excitement, but now I'm looking forward. So, hey, I'm hoping one day I can have the same testimony as you guys, and I'm just glad to be here. our second Maximum Impact experience. And I've been singing your praises, Jay, hands down. If you want to go to Africa, you got to do with Jay. There's no other way, no other way. And to be honest with you, when Renee, Jeff, and James signed up for this, I'm like, we can't let y'all go without us. And so here we are. It's just the most interesting thing in the world to come to a place such as this. It's beautiful. I mean, this is a beautiful resort. Uh, you all seem like very wonderful people. We all have something in common. We're all connected. We you know, we all are connected. Um, this is my second trip with Maximum Impact. I was in Ghana, July last year. And I brought my daughters with me. And they had a pretty rough experience because they had a lot of expectations that weren't realistic. But it took them two weeks to decompress and then to understand fully the magic that had happened on that trip. This is my mom, Claudette. And I'm very grateful that she brought me here. This is her first trip with the group, but she's been um, to Africa like three times. <laughs> and again, I'm very grateful that she brought me here. This is my second trip, and I'm going to have a third, a fourth, and a fifth. And I tell you, I'm still excited about all the things that I'm experiencing. And you would think I've been to many countries, I traveled a lot, but I've never been to a country where people look like me. Everywhere I went, I always had to fit in. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, was kind of traumatic for me after coming here and receiving, being received the way I was. I'm just looking forward to the whole itinerary. You know, it looks really, uh, I know it's really well organized and looking forward to the whole thing. So glad to meet everybody and look forward to meeting in person and talking. Hi, my name is LaDonia. Um, these are my parents and I'm really excited to be here. I'm 21 years old and thank you for hosting this trip and bringing us all here. Hi, I'm Faith Vincent Lettle. These are my parents. Um, I'm from Akron as well. This is my college graduation gift. Kids, I got 18 grandkids and, and nine great grandkids, and all of them want to come because I was so excited. Thanks to Jay, I was so oh, look. I walked through the streets of Philadelphia, lifting up. <laughs> of Africa. You got to go. I said, if you're Afro-American, you write that down on whatever form, you need to go to Africa. Travel a lot, and over the last couple years, I really wanted to do a deep discovery of Africa, all the African countries, and I found Jay, and I said, that's the way I want to do it. So we we're very, very uh, appreciative. This is my sister, Linda, and the reason I'm here is because Linda spoke so highly of the trip she was on in Ghana. Coming to Africa, I liked it. Something different. You can connect. Connecting with the people here, connecting with the workers here. I like that idea and that approach. So I wanted to come and see for myself. I remember it was November 2020 when Mr. Jay Cameron visited us. It, it was during COVID pandemic. Imagine we have 32 rooms, but he was accommodated only one guest who was Jay Cameron. <laughs> then Jay Cameron told me, I promise you, I'll bring you a group. Oh, wow. yeah. okay. <laughs> On behalf of Airport Planet Lodge, we are here to express our sincere gratitude to
to host you here today. I can't imagine doing Africa without without um, being on a Maximum Impact tour because being with a group like this just adds so much more to it. Open up.